Today, we are going to be talking about uh, Rock Island Arsenal during World Wars One and Two, which coming up with a name, an arsenal for democracy, Rock Island Arsenal in a world at war. I remember reading this off and then somebody asked me, you're making a presentation for the Rock Island Arsenal, not talking about Call of Duty. And that was a really awkward moment for me because then I remember that Call of Duty is a video game that actually has a entry called the world at war so um arsenal is open go to the arsenal do it everybody should go to the arsenal everybody listening should go to the arsenal everybody here should go to the arsenal um we have self-guided tours 70 points on those tours uh and the passes which you need to get your pass um only take 15 minutes to get those passes and they're good for a year so wait, 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 I have mine. <laughs> There's only one person here that really needs to get theirs right now. Anyway. Um, so I've noticed that as we go down these presentations that they're getting larger in size. Uh, and it's because I do goofy things like I did in this presentation that they're getting larger. Uh, so we're gonna see some evolution here on the side just a little bit, but talking about what Rock Island Arsenal looked like prior uh, to World War I. We're gonna harken a little bit to our previous talk where we talked about the Spanish-American War. We had Major Flagler come through and basically start building everything to what you pretty much see on this map here. I need to change hands here. Uh, so he builds most of these stone shops, gets most of these built. Uh, he'll move the bridge down to its present day location, but eventually he has to move, uh, move on. He'll eventually become uh, chief of ordnance. And after that, he will basically put something into place that calls for the modernization of most of the shops at Rock Island. Uh, this puts Rock Island in a really great place, though, for the Spain and War, 1898. Uh, the arsenal over exceeds expectations for that. And eventually they'll over exceed expectations so much that in 1905-06, uh, we will actually get the 1903 Springfield program at Rock Island. So all of this is tied back to Flagler in some shape, way, or form. Supporting buildings get completed by 1902. Um, and those, uh, there we go, are the um, firehouse uh, and police station, as well as the headquarters building, building 360, the rest of the two, other two buildings down here, uh, building 90, the garrison building further up. Uh, apologize to anybody who's watching the video that you can't see the laser pointer, but uh, you can kind of get the gist of it by looking at the map of things that are new. By the time though, we get to World War I and we pass World War I, there's a lot more in the way of expansion though. As you can see, so this is 1935. The green outlines show where the original arsenal building structures were. Red actually denotes the expansion in storage spaces. So there's four key locations that we have expansion in storage. Yellow is an increase in industrial capacity for Army Organic Industrial Base. It's a punchline that we love to use still to this day as the Army's Organic Industrial Base. Uh, and we'll be hearing about that a lot more when we go into rearm and AMC at Rock Island, which are our next two talks. But this is basically the expansion during World War I. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about this here in a bit. So Rock Island Arsenal in the early 20th century. We'll take a look at things real quick as to where they stood kind of on the eve of World War I. Uh, these are actual labors at Rock Island. You're talking 11, 12, 13, 14 year old kids uh, working in the shops at Rock Island. Uh, following the Spanish American War, the employment levels, things are a little bit weird in some of the records, depending on what you look at. Some of the post Span Am War employment levels fall to 1800, some of them only fall to 2000, uh, but generally it's widely accepted that they fall just below 2000 at the floor. Uh, but it continue, there's a continued fulfilling role of depot activities at Rock Island, um, 
repair and refurbishment and even production of rifles. So the 1903 program specifically, lots of leather works being produced, saddles, ammo pouches, stirrups. But more interestingly, uh, especially to people such as myself, we get some particularly interesting uh, commemorative events such as the Rock Island Arsenal Museum getting established in 1905, uh, for July 1905, which was built, uh, or not built in, I should say, it was put in building 102, which is actually across the street from the current day uh, museum. This is a picture actually of the museum when it was in building 102, complete with all four horses. And if you go to the Rock Island Arsenal today, you'll see all four horses have merged into this Camara one horse that has been pieced together from all four horses. They're all still there. It's just now they're one horse instead of four horses. Um, much of this collection was in the museum at last check, but to give you an idea of how kind of odd the museum's mission was at the get-go, it was basically the chief of ordnance shipped two boxes worth of stuff to Rock Island that says, here's stuff I want you to use to make a museum. Uh, so yes, not very organized, still isn't, uh, unfortunately, because there's just a lot of stuff there to go through. Uh, the poor director has his work cut out for him every day. Uh, Davenport House begins its rehabilitation in 1906. Uh, so, You'll start to see the Davenport House finally start to getting some of the love and attention it needs. We'll produce about 20,000 1903 Springfields from 1911 through 1912. Mm -hmm. And within this time too, we're also gonna pass uh, Fort Armstrong's um, centennial. So we will actually construct a new 1916 uh, incarnation of the original blockhouse at Fort Armstrong, which is the one that we know and see today. One thing that I want to make sure that I lay into everybody on is the apprenticeship schools for machine and motor inspection. Uh, Rock Island Arsenal is going to have a hard time with this during the interwar, but it's not going to have any problems before World War I and after World War II. It's that in-between period uh, that it really takes some extra effort uh, by a couple of individuals at Rock Island, and they kind of salvage it. Uh, you wouldn't find these kind of people around anymore, at least not in my opinion. So the manpower changes to 1917. Um, if anybody has seen the Rock Island Arsenal in World War I talk, this is probably at the point where you're just like, wait a minute, you're giving the same presentation. Ah, yes, yes I am, you're right. Because uh, we don't reinvent wheels. Um, so the big emphasis at the Arsenal up to January of 1917 is focused on the punitive expedition. And then word comes down from the War Department in February that says, hey, you remember all that stuff, all the orders that we have in for you guys that we wanted by the end of the year? Yeah. Okay, well, by the end of the year now, we mean that uh, it's currently one February. We want them done on 14 January, two weeks ago. Um, that's basically enough for the arsenal commander to say, hey, more manpower, we're going to bump the numbers up because they're rookie numbers. So even before this, we had been increasing employment. So we get to employment to around 2300 by the end of 1916. We get to a target point, we're going for 5000 by the end of 1917. We're not at war yet. We're not at war yet. And we're already wanting to increase uh, the manpower at Rock Island Arsenal by over two times. Uh, and then just to kind of give you that extra little local touch here, this is a copy of Rock Island Argus, adding an extra thousand people at the arsenal. We'll make it up to 3,100 uh, by the end of March, 3,900 in July. This number is likely low. Um, actually, I would believe that this is probably closer to 4,900. Uh, and we'll talk about that here shortly, but uh, generally speaking, on the eve that we declare war, we're at about 3,900 already. So I have a feeling uh, that this number is actually much higher. Uh, by the end of April, those kids that you saw pictures of in the last slide, along with a bunch of other guys that are working in the shop, skilled craftsmen, skilled laborers, are making 200 rifles per day. 
Uh, in addition to that, we're changing security posture on 1 February. Uh, that's, of course, after the Zimmerman note is made known to us. Uh, so there's a change in security posture and work days will eventually increase, uh, increase from eight to 10 hours by the end of March. Now, funny thing here regarding the security posture changes. I have two connections to this PowerPoint presentation, and this is one of them. My great grandfather came to the United States in the early 1900s. He came through Ellis Island. He made his way out to Iowa, wanted to enlist in the Army. The Army said, no, but you can enlist in the National Guard. So he enlists the National Guard. He ends up in the third Iowa Rangers. And in 1917, April or May, it's April or May, the third Iowa Rangers get stationed for Sentinel duty at Rock Island Arsenal. Well, my great grandfather was fresh, still re relatively fresh off the boat, could not speak English very well at all. But he knew what the directive was. If I find you in one of the fenced buildings, you need a pass. Don't care who you are, you need a pass. Colonel Hellman is inspecting one of the buildings one evening. My great grandfather finds him. Do you think Colonel Hillman had a pass? No. He proceeds to arrest Colonel Hillman. Colonel Hellman actually writes, it's in the Quad City Times, we have the story about it, uh, writes that he was actually extremely pleased uh, that uh, security was clearly in good hands at the Arsenal at this time. So that's the first thing. I can say my great grandfather arrested the Arsenal Commandant now, uh, but this also kind of gives you an idea here too. 10 million more dollars to be spent at the Arsenal, another 5 million, million here. Uh, Arsenal Grove points out need. So there's constant flows coming out here uh, in 1917 and early 1918 that the arsenal is struggling to meet uh, demand. But all at the same time, it's also excelling at demand all at the same time. It's a relative term. So there's gonna be a large amount of material that's required to sustain the war effort. Uh, we're we're going to have a real issue when we get to World War II, but we're struggling at the get-go here as well. $89.3 million is spent at the Arsenal in 1917-1918. Uh, that equates to $1.75 billion in 2022. That's over 50% of the total GDP of the Tri-Cities at the time. Uh, it's much higher than that today. The Arsenal has a much higher GDP output than that today. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how absolutely immense that was in relationship to the size of the community at the time. A lot of the large pieces that were made were uh, French 75 gun carriages. At one point, we will send some of our civilian workforce to France to learn how to make recoil mechanisms for the French 75. Uh, and they will bring that back to the U.S. and start mass producing them. So they have replacement parts because uh, replacement parts are a big need at this time. And eventually, Rock Island Arsenal is going to become known for its ability to produce air brakes, recoil mechanisms, and recuperators, uh, which all come out of this mission to France. At the same time, it's one of the only times that we see artillery shells being produced at the Rock Island Arsenal. 167,000 of those, mostly filled by women. Women ordnance workers working at Rock Island. Gee, I thought Rosie the Riveter wasn't until 1942. She's shown up a little bit early. Yes, she shows up early at Rock Island. 113,000 uh, 1903 rifles produced. Great story about this picture. This is building 60 where the museum is today. This is actually the very same hall that the museum is in. Springfield number one was made here. We have Springfield number one in the museum. There two four. Springfield number one, number one has never left building 60. It's always been in building 60. Uh, 
We talked about this a little bit last time too, but the 1910 infantry and the 1912 cavalry equipment boards were at Rock Island and produced mm -hmm. there. So we made over 3 million pieces of personal articles and 790,000 total equipment sets. That means everything that a soldier needed. We made 790,000 of those sets. So of this 89.3 million, 66.5 is spent on material. So much material is needed that we actually have to hire contractors to give us material for us to use. And then we had so many orders coming in that we also got contractors to contract so that they could have people build things for us. So you know the instances of where like in World War II, Ford was manufacturing parts for Boeing. This is the same thing happening at Rock mm -hmm. Island uh, at this time. 17 million is spent on labor, pay stubs. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't all, well, fortunately it didn't go all to one person, but I'm sure one person would have really enjoyed just walking home with all 17 million of that dollars. 17.3 uh, million spent for buildings. So all the building expansion that we're gonna talk about here shortly, um, that's part, part of it as well. The bond activities though, war bonds. Rock Island Arsenal was extremely successful and it's war bond um, generation in that it generated $4 million of war bonds during this time. So the quad or the Tri-Cities at the time, very, very much defense community coming out in support uh, of the United States in the war. So the expansion of man manpower, and this is why I made that correction here, because uh, on the eve of war, we are just over 3,900. So I believe that one figure uh, earlier was erroneous. But the arsenal is ahead of its time when it comes to equal employment. So August 1914, there's just under 2,000. Uh, 175 of those are women. July of 1916, we're going to bring it up just over 2,200 will be women. We start to see our first female uh, women ordinance workers coming in right about here. By the time we get to 6 April of 1917, a lot of these 100 that came on, they are women ordinance workers. And certainly by the time we get to the end of the war, many of them are. So we get to just shy of 15,000 uh, by the time the war breaks out. And this actually is, these are women working in the star gauging uh, and broaching shop in building 68, working on 1903 Springfields. Uh, this is actually um, a worker that's working on one of the milling machines. Um, so both of these are working, these individuals are working in rifling shops. But just to give you an idea of the change, uh, because this figure right here, most of these 175 are working administrative jobs or secretarial jobs. They weren't working out doing some of the skilled labor things or some of the dangerous stuff that shell filling was, uh, but they certainly are by the time we get into 1918. So many so that we do have our own women's auxiliary, uh, which is what uh, this top picture is here. This, this is the uh, women's auxiliary group that we had here. This is actually the, um, one of the apprentice uh, schools right here, all meeting uh, in 1918. So just a lot of activities happening during World War I. So as mentioned, we had that expansion that happened here. So this light blue line that you see here, this is the original rail line at Rock Island. The light green shows you the original buildings. The dark blue is all brand new rail. New rail that has been laid down for new buildings. So we have building 350 that's built here. Again, these are the same color codes that we used earlier. So red is storage. Uh, so building 350, that's the big white one. It's what we know today as GMC, but then it was known as where storehouse W1. So it was originally built as a storehouse. These buildings here, these are the modern day P, um, PX commissary, post office here, uh, morale, wellness and recreation is here. These are all temporary storage facilities. We have pictures of French 75 gun carriages that are stacked upon stacked upon stacked in those buildings. They're basically just there to have a roof and walls. There's nothing else to them. These are magazines and batteries down here, none of which are still present. Uh, these are ex 
the XYZ buildings, we call them. They're very similar to these buildings up here. They're just smaller. And then we have chemical laboratory and storage, which is fantastic because my command owns those now. And that's where our logistics readiness center for all of Rock Island Arsenal is located. Uh, the yellow, once again, being industrial expansion. So we have the beginnings of the Kingsbury complex. It's not on this map. There is another building that's built right here off to the side um, that is constructed and completed during World War I. Why it's omitted from this map, I'm not entirely sure. This is a 1922 map, um, but it is there. There's also, this is the ammunition filling plant. Uh, so building two, uh, yeah, building 250, um, built out of concrete and glass. Uh, if there's ever any explosions, you want the glass to blow outward so it doesn't concuss inside. There were three explosions, there were zero deaths just because of how it was built. And then we have some extra uh, research laboratories uh, that are down here. These belong to uh, Defense Logistics Agency. They do a lot of printing and things like that now. That's what those buildings are down there off to the side. And then of course, the supporting rail, that's all new leading to both of these. Uh, a lot of this rail is gone now. Um, there is no rail, that, there's no north spoke at all anymore. Uh, the south spoke is still partially there, but it's mostly the one that goes into the new, uh, the new complex, uh, which shows up over here during World War II, uh, and building 299, which is down here now, which we'll talk about here shortly. More than just that, one of the things that we talked about too during the last presentation is the amount of expansion and building that goes into uh, the arsenal during any war. Um, so there's actually two locations that aren't on this map, but these red highlighted zones actually denote places where the arsenal built houses. Uh, there's two, one location in East Moline and one in Silvis as well. Uh, but again, it's not on this map. But because the workforce at the arsenal increased so significantly, there weren't enough houses in town, or if there were, there was an issue. You're gonna laugh. So I have a little demon dog at my house. Uh, he, he makes gremlin noises and everything like that. One of the problems that people were having in Davenport is the landlords didn't want little demon gremlin dogs in the house. Okay. So they wouldn't allow people to rent to those houses or um, this is another one that, that may be a little bit personal. That's okay. Uh, there's an instance to where um, you might not want to leave your child, no matter how much you really do want to leave your child. It's frowned upon to leave your child in a house alone by himself 1,500 miles away. Uh, or just, you know, try and give him away to somebody else or, or, or her or whatever. Uh, so what tended to happen is, unfortunately, uh, arsenal workers would either not be able to get homes or they would have to live out in the boonies somewhere. And what people were finding is if they lived out in the boonies, then transportation became an issue. So the arsenal commander decided, you know, you know what, we need to get more housing in the area. So he actually got Congress to grant him funds, about $4 million worth to build new housing in all of these areas for arsenal employees and their families. Now, when I say that the construction was massive, it was massive. So there were 660 homes. Of the 660, 460 were built in 117 days. 460 houses, 117 days. Many of those houses still exist. So we are going to look at this one on the far west side of Davenport. That is this picture in 1922-ish something. This is it on Google Maps right now. Still there. Most of those houses are still there. They have been. What street is that? This is first. That runs right through here. Okay. Um, most of them have been mo modernized just a little bit, I hope. Uh, but uh, yes, most of these homes are in fact still around, still present, still standing for the most part. Um, again, not large homes, they just had to work. Uh, but they were nonetheless constructed for the arsenal. That wasn't all that we did when it came to having to do something with building and construction. So we have an issue. 
following the war. And she had an issue prior to the war ending. There are proving activities that are happening at Rock Island Arsenal. Uh, unfortunately, Rock Island Arsenal has a lot of industry on it by the time we get to World War I, and pro proofing something is just, we can do it. We just don't want to do it in town next to all of our stuff. Uh, so we want a place out in the middle of nowhere where we can do proofing of some of our stuff without having to send it out to Aberdeen or something like that. Enter Savannah Proving Ground, which if anybody can recall it, it was actually recently called Savannah Army Depot, would have been the last name that anybody would remember it as. But first it was Savannah Proving Ground. It was surveyed in 1917 and was primarily for the use of testing artillery. That's going to change after the war. It's going to change very quickly. Uh, Charles Baxter is the major who is commanding uh, the installation. The first testing at the Proving Ground is in 1917. By the end of 1917, he's going to be testing the first 155 rounds out there. But the problem is, is that what we really need is a place to store stuff because we're making all this stuff and sending it to Europe. Well, what happens when Europe doesn't need it anymore? Comes back. Don't know how many of you have ever tried moving into somebody else's house, but when two piles of crap merge, they become a super crap. <laughs> Imagine that. We wouldn't know about that. So that's pretty much what the army had to deal with is they had to deal with merging stuff that they've already made with stuff that's coming back. And that's indeed what we get here at Savannah to the point to where we just have to have a place for stuff to live. Uh, so these are in fact uh, armored cars that are sitting out within this green box here, uh, just sitting out in open storage covered by tarps. Now, what you can't really see very well is inside this green line here, there are a bunch of little dots. The little dots are one of two things. There are two things that are out here that are little dots. The first thing is bunkers. There's a lot of bunkers that are actually out there. The second thing is warehouse storage, similar to the XYZ buildings. Uh, most of those are further up here, but most of the bunkers are further down here. Uh, so, actually, this is a modern picture of the bunkers with the storehouses in the background. Finally, on 21, uh, in 1921, March of 1921, uh, the Ordnance Department separates Savannah Proving Ground from Rock Island Arsenal. So it's its own little entity now. It becomes Savannah Army Depot. It will continue to not be under Rock Island Arsenal for a few years. Because in 1955, we will establish something called Weapons Command at Rock Island Arsenal, who takes over all the depot systems activities, including Savannah. So Savannah will fall right back underneath Rock Island Arsenal, or I guess in line with Rock Island Arsenal in some shape, way, or form in 1955. Mark 8 tank would not be a talk about the world wars without the Mark 8 tank. Uh, so it was coined the international tank. Uh, that idea fell flat on its face, uh, mostly because of the French. Imagine that. Uh, so the original idea was for the Americans to make 100 of these. The 700 were going to go to the French, uh, almost 1,500 to the British. The French can't or build a plant that can produce the tank. So the French just say, forget it. We don't need we don't need it. We're gonna go do something else. The British make 31 of them and they're just like, we don't need these either. We're we're good. The Americans are just like, we have no tanks. They build all 100 of them. Uh, so of this massive supposed production of over 2,000, only 131 get made. Uh, that being said, Rock Island Arsenal receives all the orders for the Mark 8 tank. All the parts are brought in from the British and they're brought to the little island in the middle of the Mississippi River for assembly. 
And between June uh, of 1919 and July of 1920, the Rockland Arsenal will build every single one of them in that time frame, all 100 of them. Each unit was about $35,000 in $1920. That works out to about $600,000 today, which if you know the cost of an Abrams is not all that much. Uh, of all of the Mark VIII tanks, only the 66th and the 67th Infantry Regiments uh, were actually issued the tank. Most of the uh, tanks were used for training. We tried to pawn them off on Canada, which it says here that we tried to pawn them off Canada, and Canada got wise to it and said no. And what ends up happening is we end up scrapping most of these tanks. Now, the reason we end up scrapping most of the tanks, they traveled at the lightning fast speed of five miles per hour on a good day on paved surfaces with a tailwind. With a tailwind. <laughs> They had armor that was great for a regular shell 37 millimeter round that nobody used anymore because everybody was using 57 millimeter armor piercing rounds. The only benefit that the tank had is that nobody had to buy a coffin for you because you were already in one. Uh, so unfortunately it was 40 tons of steel. That was a great coffin for a crew of eight to 10. This actually is one of the apprenticeship schools down here in 1920 uh, that worked with the tanks, that was training with the tanks. Uh, so what they did provide, they provided knowledge and helped establish a doctrine for the United States to have for tank warfare. Uh, but outside of that, they didn't do quite so much else other than being the first tank the Americans actually had and produced. This is our Mark 8 tank. I went out and I got this picture and I harassed this truck driver just for this occasion, you know, a year ago, because I totally knew I was going to give this talk the following year. No, not, not really. So this is the tank from Aberdeen Probing Ground. There's only three tanks left. This tank, one at Fort Benning and one in the UK at the Tank Museum. This tank, like I said, came from Aberdeen Probing Ground. It came here in May of 2021. We're refurbishing it here, and then it's going to be put on display here. This tank is in the roughest shape of the three Mark 8s that are left. Its, in, it's insides are pretty nasty, uh, but we're going to uh, kind of try and dress up the pig just a little bit, if you know what I'm saying, because um, it, it is. It's awfully ratty. It looks kind of pretty on the outside, but this wooden panel right here should be a giveaway. I'll just say that, but they're going to make it look pretty over there. Uh, the factory, the factory knows what they're doing. Super duper excited. Everybody over there is excited to get it looking nice again. So it'll eventually get put on display here at Rock Island. So we're happy to have it home. I don't know if Aberdeen was happy to let it go, but uh, one of our volunteers at the museum harassed the director enough where he finally said fine. I'm not entirely sure that's how the story goes, but so anybody who's listening out there, you can't quote me on that because I won't claim it. The interwar period is kind of rocky for the arsenal. So the arsenal reaches its peacetime low in 1924, depending on what source you look at, there was between 450 people working at the arsenal and 710 working at the arsenal. For that reason, I didn't put a single number up there because I don't know which one of them is right, but it was low. Um, however, the production demands began to rise slowly uh, by the time we get into the 1930s because uh, Japan decides that it's going to invade uh, Manchuria, which is not good. And it's especially bad uh, when they sink a US warship uh, that's actually near China. Uh, so things get a little bit tense there. By the time we get into the 19, late 1930s, Germany is starting to do, uh, get up to its old tricks again. Uh, so the arsenal sees the writing on the wall. They start reactivating all of their shops, getting everything spun back up again. But one thing that's not up here, it's in a later slide. Again, this is one that I should have moved uh, to be a little bit sooner, is there is a man by the name of William Bombeck 
who is at the time he is a foreman for the apprentice shop for the skilled labor se uh, section. He will be the top civilian rank personnel at the arsenal during World War II. Bombeck has received an order from the Ordnance Department to close the apprenticeship school. Bombeck says no. And the Ordnance Department says yes. So what Bombeck does is he goes around to all of the other chiefs and foremen and relays, hey, we need this program. The issue is money. That's what the issue is. We all take a pay cut, we keep the apprenticeship school. Now you try convincing a bunch of senior personnel during the Great Depression to take a pay cut. Bomb that guy, each and every one of them take a pay cut. Went to the ordinance department and said, we took pay cuts, we won our apprenticeship school. The ordinance department said, fine. It's a really good thing he did because a few years later, those are the workers who are manning machines at the arsenal during World War II. So that comes up during this time. Tanks and armored vehicles are the focus during this time along with leather workshops. Uh, this is what I like to call the ugly phase of the tank development because uh, I just think they're ratty looking. Um, some people might find them glamorous, I sure don't. Uh, but the other thing that comes up is we start seeing machine gun manufacturing and refurbishing coming back to the arsenal in 1938, mainly with the Browning machine guns. Now, the big, big piece here is that they are building a lot of these guns for use on B-17 bombers. By 1939, almost all the shops have reopened. By 1940, as you'll see on the next slide, they're all open. So this is the, I hope I didn't go past one here. No, this is the expansion uh, for World War II, uh, just a selected expansion here, uh, showing some of the new uh, construction that happened here. So we'll see this, um, the, these funny little uh, in-court buildings get built into some of the U-shaped stone shops. So this is building 75 here. Um, just an extra loading bay is what this basically is. Shop B, which is the post-war location of the museum. The museum will move to building 60 after World War II. That is once again spinning up and working again. Shop K is doing all this uh, rifling, star gauging, working on the 30 and 50 caliber machine guns and 1918 and 1917 weapon systems. Shop L, which is where the artillery was being filled. They're now making artillery systems in Shop L. So all of that's being produced there, not shells, but actual weapon systems. We'll get our headquarters building conveniently in the shape of an H. I know we're creative, aren't we? Uh, the manufacturing complex is gonna get expanded here as well uh, to its modern day size, but it's not gonna be connected like it is today. Um, we will also see building 299 here get constructed. We'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, but this is the super huge building that you can still see if you drive past uh, the arsenal at the south side. That's the very large one that's there. Like I said, we'll talk about that here in a second. So this just kind of orients you of what we got going on. So again, 1940, most buildings are, they're open, they're running. Uh, signing of lend lease had increased uh, the workload for the arsenal. One of the things that Bombeck writes about, uh, and he emphasized this, is we're putting out everything in lend lease, which means that pretty much most of what that production output is, either half or most of it is going over to the Allies. So Bombeck writes in the 11 months leading up to December of 1941, when America enters, we have been making 300 tanks per month. They're getting sent over. 3.7 million refrigerators were made, 1.5 million typewriters, 2,000 aircraft per month, and 5 million automobiles. Okay, let's think about that. If most of that's going over to Europe, 
what's staying here? What are we training with? Well, depending on if you've seen the talk or not, when we did our Pearl Harbor presentation, we had a wonderful photo that I think accurately described it. It was a picture of a dude, first army patch on the side, gotta, gotta throw that stab in there, uh, complete in a Jeep. On the side of the Jeep, it spray painted tank. On the back of the Jeep is a guy with a wooden plank and a two by four sticking out of the plank. And on the side of the plank, it says 50 cal machine gun. We have nothing, nothing. All going over and lend lease. So the arsenal is therefore tasked with fixing that just a little bit, as much as they can. This is where Bombeck comes into play because he has already trained his team. He knows that those apprentices already know what it is they have to do and get out there and do the job well. So he's not worried. He's concerned, but he's not worried. There's a difference. Uh, the other big thing that's happening at this time is there's ammunition and artillery shortages. Uh, so there's a lot of shortages for just everything still coming right out the gate once World War starts for the Americans. But I wanna make sure that we really lay this in. Once again, women ordinance workers starting in. So this is 1942. Uh, they've already, we've already got uh, women ordinance workers lined up already on some of the machines in the arsenal doing work. Building 299. Uh, building 299, so if you recall, I had talked about Storehouse W1. Storehouse W1, no longer adequate. Uh, we need more storage space, so we build Building 299. We had actually built this, started on it, prior to being pulled into World War II. We started in April of 1941. 18 acres under a single roof, so 17 football fields, basically. The time it was built, it was the largest single covered space in the United States. Uh, building 350 then gets repurposed for assortments of machinery, storage, and administration, uh, especially after World War II. It runs train tracks right through the middle of building 299. The idea is that you could have two full locomotives pull all the way in, be totally offloaded, circle around, come back in, be reloaded, send them back out. All undercover. The building is leased and used by July of 1942. So the building on this is extremely rapid as well. Uh, but just to kind of give you an idea, uh, so we can have large things such as these uh, tanks and uh, cars, armed cars, but we can also have our fantastic Amazon-esque warehousing that we have here wonderful boxes that we have. Um, this is largely what Building 299 is still used for, is storage um, and final prepping before it gets sent out inevitably. Uh, so just to kind of give you a stark contrast with the kind of different things that we had in Building 299. Women ordinance workers. Yep, it would not be a talk about World War I or II uh, without the women ordinance workers. So, um, demand is extremely high at the arsenal uh, for skilled labor, so much so that we put absolutely no restrictions uh, pretty much on what uh, women workers can do. So if they need to end up in um, administrative or secretarial, that's where they go. If they're good with their hands and able to work in skilled labor, that's where they go. We're not chintzy on this. So, you're talking about female workers working in leather shops, rifle shops, manufacturing, or you get someone like my grandmother who worked in smelting uh, at a steel plant where you take other pieces of metal and melt it down and combine it into usable steel. At peak, there were almost 6,000 female workers at the arsenal. 32% uh, of the workforce, thereabout. 65% of the staff in building 299, by the way, were all women. So just an awful bunch of them. 
So in addition to that, you see a lot of them working, doing deliveries. Uh, you see a lot of them uh, running mules, things like that all over the place to make sure that things get delivered to where they need to go. Uh, just, just a ton of uh, demand, but to kind of give you an idea of the spread of the female employees. So we have stargazing going on here, weapons inspection, um, milling. We also have, you know, riveters and final inspectors on tanks. So there's plenty of jobs uh, that are out there for all these women, women ordinance workers. And they, again, there's no limit uh, to exactly what they can work with and work on. Prisoners return to Rock Island. Oh, a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, so we're gonna be doing a, a talk on the Italian prisoners, hopefully sometime next year. But just like we had POWs on Rock Island during the Civil War, we have them on Rock Island again during World War II. Uh, we also have them at Savannah during World War II. So in July of 1944, the first prisoners arrive, although they're not technically prisoners by July of 1944, they are displaced conflictors. Uh, because we are no longer at war with Italy by the time we get to July of 1944. Um, so what's really fun and interesting about uh, these individuals is that the Arsenal commander is very adamant at first, no, you can't go anywhere except Building 90. And then it's, well, you can go into the field across from Building 90. Then it's, well, okay, you can work in some of the shops around too on the Arsenal. Well, okay. You can work in all the shops, whatever shop you want. Well, all right, then I guess you can go into, you can do your mass on Sunday in, in, in the neighboring city. Well, okay, you can have pass and leave in the area as well, as long as you have US Army supervision. So it keeps evolving. Um, but uh, the 39th and 40th uh, Italian quartermaster companies do eventually volunteer. Most of them do volunteer their time at Rock Island during this time, doing things like depot activities, um, maintenance. Some of them actually do help with skilled labor. Only 15 of them return to discipline, uh, POW status for disciplinary reasons. A couple of sources cite that a pack of cigarettes has something to do with this. Would not surprise me. Uh, by the time we get to September of 1945, most of those individuals are packed back onto trains and sent to the East Coast where they will eventually be sent back home. Uh, so they are in and out relatively quickly uh, when you consider they're here for just over a year. So talking about statistics, well, not a fan of statistics, but some of these are pretty cool. Uh, 84,000, almost 85,000 <laughs> machine guns 17 or uh, 715,000 gun barrels produced during this time. Uh, 5 million metallic belt links from 1932 to 1945. I swear we still have all 5 million of them, but that's a matter of perception, I'm sure. I've had to count belt links before and it's not fun. Uh, almost 6,900 artillery carriages, 24,000 recoil mechanisms, 22,000 gun mounts, Overhauling of over 109,000 machine guns, 133,000 rifles, 9,000 carbines, 29,000 pistols, and 1,100 tanks. In addition to all the howitzers, field guns, mortars, anti tape guns, weapon carriages, caissons, um, supply carts, all those wonderful things that we were producing, as well as all the leather items and all those wonderful goods and machine tools, we're making a lot of stuff. So I've often said that it's an arsenal of stuff because there's a lot of stuff. The other thing though that uh, the arsenal was kind of known for at the time was modernizing broaching methods. Bombeck at it again. Uh, Bombeck had actually util uh, created a new form of broaching that eventually goes off to the ordnance department. It then gets patented. And then by the time World War II ends, every place is using the Rock Island arsenal broaching method for rifles. That will continue and does continue. Leisure and education. No installation is complete without any kind of leisure. Uh, 
There was plenty of leisurely activities that were going on. So you had things such as, I mean, you had the apprenticeship schools that were running in full swing for education, but for leisure, you had things like baseball teams, bowling leagues, social clubs. Um, there were outing clubs, uh, officers clubs, community gardens, which is one of the things that was cited in the Army Navy e flag citation that we got in 1944, is that uh, one of the things that most of the community gardeners were doing, they were growing fruits and vegetables. They were taking those fruits and vegetables and sending them off to uh, training camps around the United States, which is even in their off time, they were doing stuff uh, for the war effort. The morale and wellness programs did get extended to the POWs that were here at the time as well. So the Italian 39th and 40th did actually see a lot of the uh, morale and wellness programs. Uh, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea here, we've got the one of the baseball teams here up the top. And one of the outing clubs uh, pictured down here at the bottom. Just imagining some really old timey jazz coming off the dais here. Uh, but just an awful lot of events as well as once again, bond activities, war bonds. Uh, there were a lot of uh, war bond celebration days where the arsenal was just packed with people. By the way, there's a space between the ah uh and capella, not capella. Cool. So one of the other things that we had is uh, kind of like the arsenal paper of sorts. Uh, so we had, um, the Arsenal record at this time, which I love this cover because this is actually uh, an orientation, kind of an orientation uh, workers appreciation day on the cover. So this is the factory uh, in this photo and these are all Rock Island Arsenal employees. Every single one of the people in this picture. Uh, but something else to kind of keep in mind is what the Arsenal was trying to do back for the community. So we have here on the inside, talented men and women of the Arsenal provide musical diversion for civic and military audiences. Uh, so you have um, singing groups, you have the Arsenal band, uh, all coming together to kind of bring the community's mind at ease uh, just a bit uh, here during this time as well. Post-war, by the time you get to the 1946, the arsenal sheds 90% of its workforce, uh, drops down to around 1,500. It's during that time that they will pretty much do an entire renovation of all the shop space. All the shop space pretty much gets renovated at this time. The machinery gets updated, the floor space gets cleaned up. The reason they did this is to make it so that any time that there's a need for a spin-up, it's faster. It's more streamlined, it's easier. Uh, they didn't want to have a World War II situation again to where it takes for, they're already spun up, but they can't keep up with the production. And that's what this is designed for. Most of the shop activities are limited to shop M. So that's the current uh, machine space uh, that we have now today. But the apprenticeship schools get maintained and actually are expanded during this time. So it's not the same as before, during the interwar period where we see that kind of closed down, we see it actually expanded at this time. And by late 1949, uh, the arsenal is going to have to start doing spin up again because right around the corner is the Korean War. So that's all we have. Um, we don't really start to see a modern arsenal workforce until we get into the mid 1950s have to wait two months to, to hear that talk because that's not in the rearm talk, but we will talk a little bit of Korea during the rearm talk as well because we're not done with the hiccups at Rock Island Arsenal until after Korea and uh, even a little bit of Vietnam goes by. Yay.